All right, we are going to start on um, chapter five. Yay! So um, I did kind of allude to this last week. So hopefully you know how to balance an equation. Um, that is super, 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 super important for the rest of the class. So if you don't understand how to balance equations, practice it because you're going to need to be able to do that really easy. Um, there are um, three different types, three basic types of equations. Um, and they're going to expect you to know them. So we'll go through them. So I talked about this last week. Um, decomposition is the first one. So uh, decompose sounds is, is exactly what it sounds like when something breaks down. Um, so when you decompose something, um, you take uh, something that's big, a molecule that's big, and you break it down in it, into its constituent parts. Just remember, the law of mass conservation still applies. So anything that you start with is what you have to end with. There can't be things that just disappear or things that get added in. So um, let's do example um, 5.1. This is on page 134. So we have a write the chemical, equ chemical equation that describes the decomposition of ethanol. And they gave you the formula. So it's C2H. Six, O. Oh. So if it's decomposing, that means it's breaking down into, into its constituent parts. So what kind of things should we find in the end? We're going to have some carbon, we're going to have some hydrogen, and we're going to have some oxygen. Then we need to remember, do we know anything about carbon and hydrogen and oxygen? What's that? Ah, very good. Homonuclear diatomic. So let me see if I can find my periodic table again. Because um, they are going to remember. Once they teach you something in this book, they expect that you remember it for the rest of the time. So remember, the homonuclear diatomics, um, starting at nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and then everything in this row, and hydrogen, for, in this case, is in this row. So it makes a 7 right here. So you have to remember that, oh, hydrogen is a homonuclear diatomic. It's always H2 when it's by itself, and here it's by itself. Oxygen is a homonuclear diatomic, so when it's by itself, it's O2, and then carbon is not. But now it says write the chemical equation. So to be a chemical equation, it needs to be balanced. So now we have to balance it. So if you Make sure, oh look, it's a CHO problem. CHO, and now it's a little easier. Um, so, uh, well, let's, let's count. How many carbons are on this side? Two. Two. How many hydrogens? Six. How many oxygens? One. How many carbons? Well, right now, there's just one. How many hydrogens? Two. How many oxygens? Two. Okay, so um, there's no right or wrong way to answer this or to start this, um, but just because I see here in the past, I have left oxygen by itself. But when I change oxygen on this side, it's going to change everything else. Do you see that? So carbon, there's less on this side. Hydrogen, there's less on this side. But oxygen, there's actually less on this side. So I would start with oxygen. So um, how do I change this then to make that match? Where do I put the two? Do I put it here? No. Never, 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 never. No, why? Because that just changed it. It was ethanol. If I change that to a two, it's no longer ethanol. I've changed my molecule. So this is the recipe, this is the recipe, this is the recipe, this is the recipe. I can't change those subscripts. What I can change is the big number. Remember that cool name? Stoichiometric coefficient. The big number. I can change how many of these I have. So to change this oxygen, I have to put a two here. Okay, so don't change it. So that changes that. So now check, check, two, two, perfect. But it also changes this. So what does a hydrogen become now? 12. Yep. What does carbon become now? All right, so now I would go back over on this side. So how do I make my carbons match? Yes, 
Do I put it here or here? Oh, the last. Yes, always the big number. Don't. This would give you a balanced equation, but you've changed the recipe for carbon now. Carbon doesn't hang around by itself with C4, C3, four C's together. Um, so you have to change it there. And then I'm fine there, check, check. And then I gotta change hydrogen. How do I change that? Change it to a six. Right, so this becomes a six. Very good, and then oxygens. So now I have a balanced equation, okay? so. Decomposition takes a big molecule, breaks it down into its, part, into its parts. Just remember, if it breaks down into one of these homonuclear diatomics, you have to remember that that's got two, okay? They're not gonna remind you. And it's typically hydrogen, it's typically oxygen. Okay. Uh, another um, basic reaction is going to be no, oh, actually, they have another decomposition practice. So let's do that. Um, oh, so if you find, if you do the problems in the book, they have they have things where they throw some fractions in there. I loathe fractions, so I avoid them at all costs. So if, if you like fractions and you want to do it how they do it in the book, more power to you. It's not wrong. Still get the right answer. The kicker is sometimes later on when we get a little bit more difficult. It is a little easier to use a fraction, and I'll show you that too later. But um, for me, I try to avoid them. So when, when I do these problems, also I didn't mention, um, the, lowest, the lowest number stoichiometric coefficient, um, if, if everything, you could multiply everything by two or three or four, if everything can multiply through, that's probably not the best. It could be a balanced equation, but it's probably not the best one. I think there's one problem in here, I think in one of the practice problems, um, when you balance it, sometimes if you didn't start at the right place, like I said, there's usually no right and wrong place to start. If you started at one place, you sometimes get like two of these turn into, or maybe it comes out to be like eight of these, turns into four of these and four of these and two of these. Well, they're all multiples of two, and so that's not the best answer. So really, the best answer when you have a balanced equation has the lowest stoichiometric coefficient that's possible, but it has to all be divided by the same number. That might not make sense, so we'll do one that, that happens to, but just be aware. Sometimes when they use the fractions, that helps to avoid that. So let's do another decomposition. I'm going to write the balanced chemical equation. This is on 136. Balanced chemical equation for the decomposition of S, I, H, Three F. So um, I think Si silicon, hydrogen, and fluorine. So it's a decomposition reaction. So we have to end up with the same pieces that we had in the main thing. So we're going to have Si plus H plus F. And then I have to remember: is this the right formula or recipe for these things? This one I know they gave me. It's the right recipe. So I can't change any of those subscripts. I can only change this number. But these ones, I don't know. So I have to look on my little seven. Do I have anything here that is silicon, hydrogen, or fluorine? Yes, hydrogen is always homonuclear diatomic. How about fluorine? Oh look, that's right there in number nine. So that's F2 also, okay? Silicon would be on the other side. So actually it's right here. Silicon is number 14, so it's not a homonuclear diatomic, so that one has a one. So if there's not a number, it's a one. So let's balance it. So S, I, H, and F. So this side has to have S, I, H, and F. How many silicons do I have? One. How many hydrogens do I have? How many fluorines do I have? On this side, how many silicons do I have? How many hydrogens? And how many fluorines? Because they're homonuclear diatomics. So then remember, um, start anywhere that makes sense to you. Um, but I know that these are all by themselves. So I would look over here and see, I got three of these and two of these. Oh, that's kind of hard. Um, one and one's happy. One and there's actually more on this side. So um, 
I think it might be easier to go start, to start here to make that grouping. So let's try that. So let's change. How do I match the flooring? Hi, welcome. Hi. How can I make that match? Write a two in the stoichiometric coefficient. So that changes that to two, and then that changes both of these numbers. So what is my hydrogen now? And what is my silicon now? Okay, so now I go back this way. So fluorine's fine. Um, silicon, let's change that. How do I change silicon to match? I'm gonna put a two here that makes this a two. Now, how do I make my hydrogen match? I put a three here. So, okay, so decomposition. You start with something big and it breaks down into its parts. Okay, do you have anything to hand in to me? Um, I don't think so. Okay, I think I have something to give to you. Um, I'll, look, I'll look for it later. Okay. Did you give it to your assistant? Oh, there it is. That's where I left it. That's why you decided. Perfect. All right, so decomposition. Next thing, formation. What does formation sound like? Taking parts and I'm forming them together, right? So it's the opposite of decomposition. So now I'm going to have some constituent parts that I'm going to join together to make into a molecule. So formation um, a reaction starts with two or more reactants and it turns into one compound. So example 5.2 on page 138 says write the chemical equation for the formation. That means I'm forming Mg. CO3. So read your questions. Make sure if they say decomposition, then you've got the big thing turning into smaller parts. Now I'm forming this, so I gotta figure out the parts that go into make this up. So just like when I'm making chocolate chip cookies, I have to have everything in my house, in my kitchen first so that I can form them. Right? So what kind of things do I have that I should start with over here? You don't need to know the name, what letters should I have? Magnesium. Mg, it's actually magnesium, plus, carbon. yep, C is carbon, and O is oxygen. Very good. Do I know anything about magnesium, carbon, and oxygen? Hmm, let's look at my periodic table. Um, let's look in my little seven here. Is oxygen there? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. So it's a homonuclear diatomic. I have to have a two there. Is magnesium there? Mm, nope, it's over here. So, um, is carbon there? Carbon is just outside of that seven, right? So that's so that formula is correct. That formula is correct. That formula is now correct. Okay. So now that I have my recipes right, now I balance. M G C O, M G C O. How many magnesiums do I have on this side right now? One. Carbons. Oops, not negative one. One. Oxygen. Magnesium on this side, carbon's on this side, it's one. Oxygen's on this side. Am I going too fast now? You missed the first couple. Okay. Okay. Am I balanced? No, I'm not. So, no, really no right or wrong place. So I would look and say, hmm, I have more of these. And again, once I change one of these, it's going to affect all of them. So I'm going to start probably here. Um, so how can I, actually maybe I won't. Um, no, that's really the only place I can start. So um, how can I make these match? Oh, that's a kind of tricky one. Hmm. Make them both six. So if I make them both six, that, uh, well, yes. I think, I think I understand what you mean. You mean you made, make this into six, how do I do that? Uh, mm-hmm. That would make this six, which affects my carbon, which is now two, which affects my magnesium, which is now two, right? Okay, so now if I made that six, I have to also change this to be what? Three. That makes that six. I thought you meant uh, make them into six, but that's not what you meant. So, 
So I have now six of these and six of these. So now that's balanced. Check, check. Is my carbon balanced? No, so that's easy fix. I want to put a two there. Remember, I can't change the subscript. I can only change the stoichiometric coefficient, the big number, okay? So that's a two. And then magnesium, I want to be two. So again, I can only add the big number, okay? Once I get my recipes right, don't change any more of your subscripts. Then you have to balance with the big numbers, okay? All right, so let's say uh, I had it balanced, but I had everything like maybe this was four and four and six and four. Would that all have the same? Would it be balanced? It would be balanced, but it's not actually correct because they are, are all multiple of two. Okay, so just so you know. There's, I think there's one kind of trick one on the test and I, when I did it, I usually take your tests. Um, when I did it the first time I got a multiple and I was surprised that I got it wrong. Oh my goodness, what did I do wrong? I did not count right or something, but I started in the wrong place and I got them all, they were all multiple of something. So, trick question, I hate that. Okay, um, all right, example five, three. A but, oh, um, the, okay, so there's decomposition, formation, and the other one is combustion. What does combustion sound like? Anyone know what combustion is? Oh, my favorite part of chemistry is blowing things up. So chemistry, it's fun because you mix things together. Sometimes they explode. Sometimes there's a fire. Sometimes that's what fireworks are. That's the chemistry makes colors. It's amazing. You ever been to COSI and they like, light those balloons on fire and sometimes they like explode really loud sometimes there's a bright flash super fun um, so combustion is is making fire okay so have anybody ever any pyromaniacs out there so anybody ever make a fire what do you need for a fire usually something to burn something to burn anything else a lighter okay a lighter oxygen oxygen very good. So if you were a fireman, right? Maybe you know a fireman. Um, so if you were a fireman and you wanted to put a fire out, sometimes what they do is they spray it with a foam, right? What does the foam do? It takes away all the oxygen. Or if you have a fire in your house, what do you do? You have to close all the doors and close the windows because that feeds the fire and that makes a bigger fire. If your fire out in your fire pit is going out, what do you do? You blow in it and you make it so that it's bigger because you add the oxygen. So you have to remember when they say that it's a complete combustion reaction, complete combustion means you have to add in oxygen and they probably aren't gonna tell you that. And then it's going to turn it into carbon dioxide and water. So when you're done burning your fire out there, sometimes you have some other ashes and stuff, but you lost some carbon dioxide and you lost some water. Probably didn't see the water because it's so hot, it's steam, it's gone. Okay, but remember that you have to add oxygen. So example 5-3 on page 139 is a butane pocket lighter works by evaporating and then burning the liquid butane C4H10 stored in it. Write a balanced chemical equation for this complete combustion reaction. Okay, so, and they, they say complete combustion. We'll talk about an incomplete combustion reaction later, but um, complete combustion means that it turns into carbon dioxide and water but you have to remember to add oxygen. So when we're balancing the equation, they gave us C4H10, and they, they told us that it's a combustion reaction and it turns into, didn't, they didn't tell us, they expect you to know it turns into carbon dioxide and water, which is H2O. Carbon dioxide, remember di means two, and water, hopefully you know it's H2O. But because they said combustion, I have to remember to add oxygen, okay? And I have to know that oxygen is a homonuclear diatomic, it's always O2, okay? So, oh look, it's a problem with C, H, and O. There's gonna be scads of these because they can react all different kinds of ways. And when it's C, H, and O, and O is by itself over here, again, I usually save that till the end because it's usually easiest to balance by itself. So let's write our numbers. How many carbons are on this side? Four. 
How many hydrogens are on this side? Mm. How many oxygens are on this side? Mm. All right. How many carbons? Mm. How many hydrogens? Mm. I switched over there. And oxygen. Ah, tricky. It's going into two different places. You can add them together in your head. I like to see that it's going into two places, so I'll write down two numbers. Just add them in my head later. So how many oxygens are here? Mm. How many oxygens are here? So I know that when I balance it, I have to, it goes into two different places. Sometimes that's easy, it's helpful to see. So, and I know that's three. So I have to make sure this side says three. Okay, so where do I start? I don't know, usually I leave this till the end. Usually I start with my carbons. If you wanna start somewhere else, not wrong. So let's balance my carbons first. How do I change this to match? Four. I add a four up here, that changes that, but that also changes this. So now, how many oxygens do I have there? Uh huh. So that's four times two. So I have eight oxygens, which means I now have nine on this side. So carbon's happy. How about hydrogen? Is hydrogen happy? Nope. How do I change this side then to make a match? I add a five here. That makes that a ten. But then, oh look, now I don't. I have how many oxygens there? I have five. Now I have eight and five. So what's eight and five? Darn it. It's an odd number. Oh, so how, how can I make this match? How can I make this two into a 13? I would have to, if I wanted to, I could do what? Um, six and a half times, times oxygen but can I have a half of a molecule? I cannot. So if I wanted to, I would say that's 13, balanced, but it's not correct. So just like before, when we had our stoichiometric coefficients that were too big and they were all multiples of something, I can't have a stoichiometric, I can be balanced, but I can't have a stoichiometric coefficient that is a half of one. So even though my number is balanced, it's wrong. So I have to multiply everything up now to get rid of that half. So I just would know that I have to multiply this by two. So, um, so I do two times that. So um, what's two times be 13, right? So that's 26 um, and this is one. So I have to multiply that by two. And this is four, I have to multiply it by two and this is five, I have to multiply by two. So once I do it to one thing, I have to do it to all of it. And again, the whole reason I did that was because I can't have a fraction. And now, if you really wanted to, you could just double check that everything's correct. How many carbons do I have? Eight. How many hydrogens? Eight. 20. How many oxygens? 26, right? How many carbons? How many oxygens? Remember, it goes into two places, so there's 16 there. How many hydrogens? How many oxygens? Plus 10, and 16 and 10 better be 26. Check, check. Okay? So, like I said, I hate fractions, but when you get an odd number on one side and an even number of, of a homonuclear diatomic, well, you gotta do something to get rid of it. Okay. Um, all right, so incomplete combustion. So this was a combustion reaction where I added oxygen and I ended up with carbon dioxide and water. So I'll say that when you have complete combustion, you add oxygen and you end up with carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide and water. Always carbon dioxide and water, okay, for complete combustion. So sometimes um, you will have something that's called incomplete combustion. That means you don't have enough oxygen and then you don't end up with carbon dioxide. You end up with carbon monoxide or carbon by itself with its ash. Once upon a time, we had some snow that blocked our fireplace and all of a sudden, instead of having a nice, wonderful fire that we're enjoying, we had billowing smoke inside of our house, which was actually a good thing because carbon, uh, carbon by itself, I can see as black smoke. 
but what I can't see is carbon monoxide. So if I would have had just enough oxygen to make carbon monoxide, we would have been here enjoying our fire and not realizing that we're having carbon monoxide pour in here and then I would have been, we would all fallen asleep and not would have woken up, right? Carbon monoxide is poisonous gas, um, also comes out of the back of your car. And so I'm sure you've heard of, you know, people who close the garage door, start their car and they fall asleep and they don't wake up. So um, not a good thing. So that's what happens when you get incomplete combustion. So you don't have enough oxygen. It turns into carbon monoxide, poisonous gas, or carbon black sooty stuff, okay? Probably in your houses, you all have a carbon monoxide detector. Hopefully you have a carbon monoxide detector um, because it doesn't smell like anything and all of a sudden you, you, you don't wake up. It's kind of a problem. So you're, um, sometimes your um, heater in your house, if there's a leak in it, it can have carbon monoxide come in your house. Okay. Um, balancing equation is super important. Next. Um, we're going to talk about something that, I mean, it's a good thing to know, and I'm going to teach you, but then I want you to erase it out of your brain after this chapter, because it can be confusing later on. So, um, on your periodic table, which you all should have plenty of copies that you can use anytime, um, there's numbers on all of your boxes. Okay, so there's a letter, like for number number one, has a, a number one, and then there's an H for hydrogen, and then there's a little number underneath there that's 1.01. Okay, what do those numbers mean? So H means that it's hydrogen, okay, so they all have a name. Um, it's always a capital letter, sometimes a capital letter with a small letter. Um, the number one, later on we'll talk more about this, but that means how many protons is in that. Um, so they each add one as you go up the periodic table. One, two, three, four, okay, so they all add one. Um, but the number at the bottom is called the atomic mass unit. Atomic mass unit or AMU, sometimes AMUs, okay? So what's an atomic mass unit? Um, it's your atomic uh, mass unit is uh, 1.66, I'm going to make my mice. you won't have to memorize it, they'll give it to you. It's 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. So if I took one hydrogen atom and I weighed it, it would weigh 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams, okay? I have a hard time imagining that in my head, okay? So again, it's important to know for this test, it's important to know what an atomic mass unit, I would say it's important to know it's super small, okay? Times 10 to the negative 24th means you have a decimal and then 23 zeros before you get to 166, okay? That's a lot of zeros, super small, okay? That's what's important to know. So they're not gonna have you memorize this number. You will need to use it for this test, and then it'll be up at the top. They'll tell you what the AMU is, okay? It's 1.66 times 10 to the 24, negative 24 grams. So um, on page 143, it says, what is the mass of a nitrogen atom in grams. Okay, so, um, so nitrogen, I have to find nitrogen. So uh, it's number seven here on the periodic table. And so this is, also this is a conversion problem. We did conversion problems first chapter where we converted um, centimeters into kilometers and the grams into kilograms and back and forth. Okay, it's just a conversion unit. The reason you can do a conversion is because really you're multiplying by one. Only the one has the, what's on the bottom, what you want to cancel out, and what's on the top, what you want to go to. Okay? So if it is 14.0, 
And this number on the bottom is AMU, so the atomic mass units, AMU. I just want to convert that to grams. So they gave you that it's 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams equals one, um, equals one AMU. So I just have to multiply, if this equals this, I wrote up too high. If that equals that, then I just make it into a fraction because any number over itself, like eight over eight, is multiplying by one. So anything that's on the top and the bottom, if they're equal to each other, I'm not changing the number, I'm just changing how it looks, okay? So it's just a conversion. So I want to get rid of AMUs, so that's gotta go on the bottom, and I wanna go to grams, so that's gotta go on top, and these have to be equal, it has to be a true statement. So how many grams are in one AMU, or how many AMUs in one gram? Well, in one AMU, it's 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 gram. So then I divide by the bottom number, my AMUs cancel out, and I multiply by the top number. But this is the kicker. Do you know on your calculator, this is why I encourage you all to have a calculator, not just a phone. You can use a scientific calculator on the ACT, SAT, and you should be able to use it. And everybody's is a little different. So you should be able to find on your calculator where the times 10 to the negative something, be able to do times 10 to the negative 24 in your calculator. Do you have a calculator with you? Do you have a calculator with you? Not with me. Okay, so I highly encourage you to, this is, chapter two is really evil and has a lot of this. So we skipped it and we'll get back to it in February. But you need to be familiar with your calculator. So this is not a hard problem um, as a conversion because there's just one step but you need to know how to do 14 times 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 in your calculator. So on mine, it's, one, it's 14 times 1.66 times 10 to the 24th means I gotta go EE -E means times 10 to the, and then I have to press 24 negative. So maybe you have an EE -E button, you might have a little button that says Y to the X, Everybody's is a little different. Mine is two big E's like this. So make sure you can use your calculator. Because again, not a hard problem if you know how to use your calculator. And then equals, and this should be um, 2.324 times 10 to the negative 23rd on my calculator. Is that the right answer though? No, because actually, yeah, this has three significant digits, this has three significant digits, so this can only have three significant digits. Remember we talked about significant digits? So it's not actually accurate, so that's really bad. 2.32 times 10 to the negative 23rd. Oh, and my whole point of doing this problem is to give myself a gram, so it's grams, okay? So um, again, not a hard problem, but make sure you have the right significant digits Make sure you set it up so your AMUs cancel out. Make sure you have a unit because uh, units are important because that's the whole purpose of the question. And um, make sure you know how to do the times 10 to the negative 24 in your calculator. Okay. All right, so now example 5.5 says, and actually, did anybody see, oh, what was the movie called? The Descendants. It's kind of a dumb movie my little girl's like. The Descendants was like, Disney princesses who are like live action and it was there well I guess Disney kids of the princesses the evil people and the good people and the evil kids went to the good kids land or something and one of them I can't remember which one my girls could tell you and she had like this magic mirror that gave her answers and she was doing a chemistry problem and she read how many AMUs something was but she didn't know what an AMU was and so she said it was the AMUs anyways kind of funny if you know chemistry but it's a dumb movie so if you have never seen it don't waste your time okay example five five what's the molecular mass of c h c l three oops if i can write correctly it would be easier in amus okay well this isn't too hard of a problem but you need to know 
of what they're asking. So they're asking how heavy is this in atomic mass units. I don't know why you would care because I can't even imagine what an atomic mass unit, I can't hold it, I mean, if I hold it in my hand, I wouldn't even feel it, um, but I can figure it out. So how many carbons do I have in this? I have one, so I look up carbon, it's number six on here, and that's 12.0 AMUs, and there's only one of them. How many hydrogens are in this? One, so I look up hydrogen, it's number one, it's 1.01 AMUs. Now, that's the hard thing, maybe, if you don't remember, is when I'm adding things together, I'm going to line up my decimal. Okay, and chlorine, where is chlorine? It is number 17, so it's 35.5, but the problem is I have three of them. So first, I have to go three times 35.5, um, so, if you do that in your calculator, you'll get three times 35.5. Oops, I'm still in atomic mass units. Okay, three times 35.5 is 106.5. <coughs> okay, so I have to line up my decimals and then I'm going to round when I'm adding and subtracting significant units, I round to the least significant place. When I'm multiplying significant digits, I round to, this has three, this is an exact number, so it doesn't count. I have round, the, I have three significant digits here, so actually um, I should have, I can, I should have three significant digits in my answer, but I'm going to leave it here. Okay, so, um, so I, I add and I add these up and I'm gonna round to the least significant place. So I add them up and I get 119.51, right? But when I round to the least, the least significant place, it's in the tenths place, so the right answer is 119.5. And the whole point of the problem was to figure out how many A and U's it was. So if I had a molecule of this, it would weigh 119.5 AMUs, okay? All right, let's see. Um, all right, um, what is the mass of a molecule, big molecule, in grams? Okay, so now I'm gonna take those two things, I know how to find the AMUs, and I know how to convert AMUs to grams. So now this is a two-step problem, okay? So this is the second, uh, on page 145, second part of 5.5. So I have to first figure out SI6, oops, it's an I, SI6, F12, O6, how many grams is that gonna be? And again, they told me that there is 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24, a, uh, uh, grams and one AMU. Okay, so I have to find silicon on here. Hmm, where is it? Anybody find it? No, you never bring your tables up. Um, you can always just go like this, flip to the front. It's right there too. So there's six silicon. So that's twenty. So there's six times twenty-eight point one, and then I'm going to add what's. Uh, 12 times, what's fluorine is up in this corner, so it's 19.0 plus, there's six oxygens, oxygen's right next to fluorine, so six times 16.0, okay? Oh, people can't see that. Okay, so I, uh, I would stick it in my calculator and do it uh, if you're not sure. Um, do six times 28 and then 12 times 19 and six times 16. If you don't know how to use your parentheses, um, so you should get, um, oh, I don't have, anyways, if you add it all together, you should get 492.6 AM use, okay? But that's not the answer because they said, what is it in grams? So now I have to take my 492.6. Um, again, I'm adding them together and they're all gonna be rounded to the least significant place, which is the tenths place. So 
0.6 AMUs, I'm going to multiply it so that my AMUs that are on the bottom so they can cancel out. My grams are on the top because that's what I want to go to. So there's in one AMU, they're 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. So I need to be able to put 492.6 times divided by one, which doesn't change it, times 1.66 minus EE times 10 to the negative 24. So again, the hard part here is, can, do you know how to use your calculator? And that should give you 8 point, well it's 17716 times 10 to the negative 22. Is that accurate? It's accurate. Is it finished? No, it's not finished. The whole point of the problem was to give me grams. I better have a gram there. And I only have, I have three significant digits there. I have four significant digits there. And so I can only have three significant digits in my answer. Because this one only has three. So, and this one only has three. So I have to round this to three significant digits. One, two, three, that means I look at this one and I decide does that round my seven up or does it round it down? And it rounds it up. So that becomes an eight and that falls away. And you still have to have times 10 to the negative 22. Okay? All right, one more thing. So uh, I was saying to you that um, I hate AMUs. You know why I hate AMUs is because I can't imagine it. I can't even fathom what times 10 to the negative 22 is, times 10 to the negative 24. I can't even imagine that in my head. It's too small. So um, a guy, a scientist named Avogadro, couldn't imagine it either. And he, I don't know, had a lot of time on his hands. He figured out that... If you, if you, how could this number on the bottom be more useful than AMUs? A little something more to be able to imagine in your head. And he figured out that if he took a very large number of pieces of each one of these things, um, he could get the same, he could get the same number on the bottom the AMUs, he could get that into something that he could actually weigh in the lab. And so how he figured it out, I don't know, but I love him for it because he figured out that if he had, this number you are gonna have to memorize just because we like to give him credit. So just like there is um, 12 and a dozen, just like there's two in a pair, just like there's, um, you know, any, any uh, amount for a certain number, we memorize this number. And this number is, um, I don't want to get it wrong, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So that's why they're not going to make you memorize two that have an exponent. They're two kind of close together. So he figured out... If he had 6.02 times 10 to the 23 pieces of hydrogen and he weighed them, they would weigh exactly 1.01 grams. He figured out if he had 6.02 times 10 to the 23 pieces of carbon, they would weigh 12.0 grams. I can weigh 12.0 grams in my lab. I cannot weigh whatever the other one was, right? I can't weigh, I can't imagine uh, AMUs. I can know, I know what grams are. One gram is about a paper clip. I can hold a gram, okay? When I, when I use the scales that we use in our lab, we measure grams. So I can measure grams. So all of a sudden, this doesn't give me some imaginary number that I can't imagine. They give me exactly things that I can measure in my lab. Oh, Avogadro, thank you. So this is called Avogadro's number. We give him credit for figuring out how many pieces it takes to weigh this many grams, okay? And when you have this many grams, it's called a mole. So just like 12 donuts make a dozen, when I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 pieces of it, 
I have a mole. And when I have a mole of it, it weighs this much, that number on the bottom of every single one of these squares, it weighs that much in grams. So a mole of carbon is 12.0 grams. A mole of uh, fluorine is 19.0 grams. A mole of aluminum is 27.0 grams. So just like if I have a dozen cars or if I have a dozen donuts, that's not the same size. It's the same amount of pieces, right? If I have a pair of dogs or a pair of shoes, they're not the same size. They don't look alike. It's the same amount of pieces. So this picture is a great picture in your book, 147. When I have a mole of water, it weighs 18.0 grams. And it's this much. If I have a mole of NaCl, which is salt, sodium chloride, and I weigh it, it's 58.5 grams. That means I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 pieces of salt. And they're in this, this thing, and I can measure that, okay? So if I have a mole of helium, I can fill a balloon. And that means that inside that balloon is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 pieces. So you are gonna have to memorize this number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Um, they are gonna expect you to know that it's a mole. And the amazing thing is, when we balance a chemical equation, my stoichiometric coefficient, the big number, tells me how many moles I have. So it's actually really useful. So you're gonna to have to get used to using moles, okay? So let's see, do we do any problems with this? All right, let's, example five, six. This is on page 148. How many moles of fluorine atoms exist in 50 gram sample of fluorine? So that means I have 50.0 grams fluorine. So I can weigh 50 grams on my scale and they want to know how much is that? Do I have a whole mole? Do I have two moles? Do I have a half a mole? So um, let's figure it out. So then this is just a conversion now between moles and grams. And I know that this number tells me how many, how many moles I have. Okay, so um, so I'm going to take, uh, I want to get rid of my grams and I want to go to moles. So I'm going to go, I want my grams to cancel out, on, so that's going to be on the bottom, and I want my, my moles to be on the top. Hmm, where do I find how many moles and grams and whatever of fluorine? So remember that that number, I told you it's AMUs, fine, it's AMUs. So remember that for this test. But for the rest of the year, Remember that this number on the bottom is how many grams are in one mole. So yes, it's atomic mass units, but really what's more important is how many grams are in one mole. So if I find fluorine on here, yes, it's 19.0 AMUs, but it's also 19.0 grams in one mole, okay? And this is how we'll use it the rest of the year. So yes, I am used, but more importantly, grams per mole. And I can always, whatever I have over here, I wanna cancel out, that's what's gonna go on the bottom, whatever I want to go to is gonna be on the top, and I can switch this if I wanna go the opposite direction. That's just a conversion. So I divide by the bottom number, I multiply by the top number, so I'm gonna take 50, I'm gonna divide it by 19, I have three significant digits here, three significant digits here. So I should have 2.63 moles of fluorine, okay? So that one you should be able to do in your calculator super easy because there's no exponents. Okay, so um, one more. People are encouraged to limit their table salt intake to 5.000 grams per day. How many moles of sodium chloride is that? All right, so I'm given 5.000 grams of NaCl, and 
typically I have students who don't like to write. They like to do these things in their head. I don't know why. It's, my boys are always like that. Maybe it's boys. I don't know. But typically they don't like to write all of the letters. Just save yourself time. Write your letters because this is easy and we're going to build on this. And so if you write all of the letters, grams is important, NACL is important. Just write it all out. Save yourself headaches later. So I have that many grams per day and I want to know how many moles that is. So it's just a conversion going from grams to moles. So I'm going to multiply such that now my grams is going to be on the bottom and my moles is going to be on the top. But how do I know how many grams is in NACL? Huh. Well, before I found out how many grams of fluorine was in fluorine, how do I figure out sodium and chlorine together? Well, this is my recipe, one sodium, one chlorine. So I was gonna to get to my periodic table and one mole of sodium chloride is going to be one sodium plus one chloride from the numbers that are on the bottom of here. So I'm going to look up sodium, which is Na, it's over here number 11. So that's 23.0 and chlorine is 35.5. So I'm gonna do it underneath 35.5. I round to the least significant place. And so I'm going to be five, eight, 58.5. So if I have 58.5, grams of sodium chloride, I have one mole of it. So I put 58.5 grams here. I take five divided by 58.5 times one, which doesn't change it. My grams cancel out and I'm left with, and this is moles NaCl. So my answer is in moles of NaCl. So five divided by 58.5 is 0 0.0855 moles. This is a zero. And I have four significant places there, but I only have three significant places here. So my answer only can have three significant places. Okay. All right. So that kind of puts the two together. But moles, Avogadro, super smart. 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Avogadro's number. It's, if I have that many pieces of something, it's one mole of it and it weighs whatever it is on the bottom. And if I have a molecule of something, I just take my recipe and I add them together and that's gonna be how, many mole, how much that one mole of that recipe weighs, okay? Did I lose anybody? Perfect, so get a scientific calculator. Make sure you know how to find your times 10 to the button. And like I said, on mine it says EE, -E, but other I've seen other calculators that say other things. And next time we'll do an experiment on how big an atom is, kind of, okay?